This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. (laughs) Welcome to Bigger Questions, recorded live in Melbourne's CBD. Today's big question, is the resurrection just wish fulfilment? We ask this question today to Helen Bell. Helen worked as a policy advisor for Commonwealth Treasury on indirect taxation. She now works for a Christian group with university students at La Trobe University, and she joins me now. Please welcome Helen Bell. (laughs) Helen, welcome to Bigger Questions. Pleased to be here. Now, so Helen, you worked as an advisor on indirect taxation. Now, that's a while ago, but what did you advise on? Uh, I was working, um, I was a little graduate working in the Federal Treasury Uh, Keating's last term and Howard's first term. So I did indirect taxation, lots of GST stuff actually, before the GST came into being. So we have you to blame for the GST, is that right? I I wasn't there when it actually came in. (laughs) I I did the numbers, I used to estimate numbers. Okay, did you come up with a 10%? No, 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 but I told them how much it would make. (laughs) Now you work with university students, what do you love about that? I love that I work with people from all over the world. Our universities are really international now. Uh, We talk about things like, what is life about? Why are they here? What are they doing? I love that we talk about why they think what they think, Mm -hmm. because if you can't do that at uni, I'm not quite sure where you can do it. Here are bigger Uh, questions, perhaps? Yes, yes, (laughs) this is good. Um, And I love that it's not just about learning what other people think. It's as you learn what other people think, you're forced to actually think, why do I believe what I believe? Mm. And am I evaluating my own current ideas with the same rigour that I'm asking questions of other people? I think Mm. sometimes we can be really hard in interrogating, um, but we don't actually look at our own views Mm. with the same degree of rigour. And I think that's what integrity, one of the aspects of integrity, actually. Mm. I'm going to look at myself in the same way I I ask you questions. So in some ways you you ask the bigger questions with university students. Yeah, and I really enjoy that. And sometimes you come up with answers and sometimes you come up with more questions, but I think that's okay. Yeah, if you're honest, I think Mm. that's okay. Uh, To kick off bigger questions, we like to ask a couple of smaller questions. We do try to have a bit of fun on the show. And Helen, today we're asking if Jesus' resurrection is just wish fulfillment. So we thought we'd test you on how much you know about wishes. Now, have you ever wished for anything? Uh, When I was young, I wished that I was a first-class test cricketer. I was going to be a spinner. I was watching it in the era of Shane Warne. It was a very sad day when I realised that was never going to happen. I I wish I could speak different languages. I've got English and Year 7 Italian. I can count to 10. (laughs) Wouldn't it be nice to speak four or five different languages? Mm. It'd be wonderful. Okay, well, we'll see how you go on this one, on, uh, on how much you know about wishes. It's two questions, both multiple choice. Question one. In the old folktale Aladdin, a boy finds a magic lamp, and when rubbed, a genie appears able to grant three wishes. Now, in the 1992 Disney movie, the genie gives Aladdin three rules about how the wishes are to be used. Which of the following is not one of the three rules that the genie gives to Aladdin? Was it A, that he can't kill anyone? B, that he can't make people fall in love? C, that he can't save anyone from paying taxes? or that D, he can't bring anyone back from the dead. So which of the following rules was, which one of those was not one of the three rules? I actually haven't seen it. I'm not someone who likes animation. My husband loves it. I don't, um, the tax one speaks to my heart, (laughs) but I reckon fall in love. You can't make anyone fall in love with you. Well, I reckon you should probably go with your first, your heart. Go with your heart. Okay, you can't prevent people paying taxes. That's right. Yes, that's correct. The answer is actually C. You can't save anyone from paying taxes. Uh, Did you think you wanted a magic genie when you were working for Federal Treasury? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You spend your life kind of trying to plug holes as people come up with creative ways of um, avoiding taxation. (laughs) It's not always the most exciting job at that point. Okay. Well, question two, and we'll see how you can go with this one. Which popular book claims that your wishes can be fulfilled by focusing on positive thoughts? Was it A, the Bible, B, the secret, C, the diary of Anne Frank, or D, the making of Donald Trump? Now, some of them I haven't read. I'm confident it's not the Bible. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's one I've got a comparative advantage. Yeah, I, I, I reckon yeah. it's the secret. I remember seeing a, a YouTube clip that yeah. if I just thought hard about something, the universe would give I it to you. I could make it so. Yeah, and that's correct. The answer is then B, The Secret. The Secret's an enormously popular book promoted by Oprah mm. Winfrey and has sold over 30 million copies worldwide. Mm. So congratulations, Helen. You nearly got two, but you got one out of two of our smaller questions, right? Big round of applause for Helen. 
thankfully, my self-esteem is not built on how I do. <laughs> Very good. Now, Helmut, today we're here to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, according to the German philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach, the idea of the resurrection of Christ is nothing more than an echo of the deep human longing for immediate certainty of personal immortality. So in his mind, it was merely wish fulfillment of the early disciples. Surely the belief that a man died but was then raised to life to offer eternal life is just simply too good to be true? I mean, it is a strange thing. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, is it too good to be true? Well, the fact that something's good doesn't make it untrue in and of itself, yeah. I, I would argue. So I think when you're thinking about the resurrection, you're asking questions about have I got good reasons to believe it? Yeah. Christianity purports to be based in history. It mm -hmm. actually says certain events happened in human time and space. So I think it is right to actually ask questions about, have I got good reasons for believing this happened yeah. in human time and space? And there's certain things that happened about 2,000 years ago that I think a resurrection makes sense of, yeah. and that's worth asking questions about. Yeah. So when you go, there's actually a number of independent eyewitness accounts that talk about a, an empty tomb. Jesus died. Yep. He was put in a tomb. When people rocked up a couple of days later uh, to care for the body, the tomb was empty. Mm -hmm. So that, you think there are, there are good reasons then yeah, to believe that it actually did I, happen? I historical reasons? I think there are historical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that multiple witnesses attest to. Um, even people, even those who were hostile to Jesus, no one was kind of saying, oh, the body was there, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, the stories of the resurrection came about really early on. Uh, almost immediately after the events. If you wanted to quash it, how do you quash it? You produce a body. Yeah. They didn't. What they said was the body's been stolen. So it's interesting, the whole idea of an empty tomb, at the time, people weren't questioning that the body was gone. I would argue because Jesus was using it again. Mm. But I understand people had different interpretations. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and they weren't, the interesting thing is they weren't expecting it. Yes. It, it wasn't like they had in their brain, Jesus will rise from the dead. Oh, look, this is what I thought would happen. Well, that's what happens with wish fulfillment, I suppose. That, that's, what, that's what happens with wish fulfillment. All of the, the, all of the story leading up to that is we had no idea this was going to happen. Hmm. So it's actually a jar. It, it's, and there's no, idea, there's no kind of picture of it in their contemporary culture either. Hmm. Whether you kind of go the Greco-Roman world or whether you go the Jewish world, no one was thinking a physical body is going to die, come back to life, and I'm going to be able to chat with him. Yeah. So it's, it's not even as though their culture predicted it. Yeah. And then well, we'll come to some of those issues in a moment or two. But for Feuerbach, the character of Jesus portrayed in the New Testament, it was simply a fantasy figure who just endorsed human hopes and aspirations. Is, is that a fair appraisal of Jesus? See, I actually think he poked around at human hopes and aspirations and challenged them. Yeah. He's quite persistent in his constant challenging of what people are like. Are we nice? Are we good? What do we love? And so I, I don't think he does just kind of endorse what people already want. He seems to be trying to say, you, you want too little. You need to want more. Mm. Um, he talks about not just love, love is good. He talks about loving your enemies. It's so almost like he ratchets it up. So if you're hoping for a nice family and a nice little community, I'm telling you, you've got to, you've got to aim for more than that. It's more radical than that. So it's uh, it, much more radical than that. And that then challenges you to look at yourself. You're actually starting to think, I'm not the person I thought I was. I'm really not the person I hope to be. Um, and that's, that's quite disconcerting, actually. Mm. Um, I won't say he undermines them. He challenges you about whether they're enough, whether they're good enough, mm. whether, whether you should hope for more, mm. expect more. So what happened when you uh, we encountered Jesus yourself about the, 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 the questions that he asked of you, uh, perhaps? I mean, for you, the, the concept of Jesus' resurrection uh, as being just wish fulfillment was important to you in your reflections on the Christian faith. So maybe you could share some of your story, Helen, about what you, you grew up in a Christian home, but... What convinced you of the truth and the relevance of yeah, the Christian I'd message? Say I, I think I've always been Christian. I grew up hearing stories of Jesus died, Jesus rose again. Although we did have one minister that didn't believe in the resurrection at one point, which is interesting. I'd consider that a fairly core belief for a yep. Christian. I think I always believed it, but I don't think I understood it very well. I didn't understand what it meant. Yeah. It was just some statements, Jesus would look after you, he died and he rose again. I think I first understood what it actually meant when I was about 15 and I was away on a camp. And I understood that um, it, God is the one who gives me life. And I spend my life uh, telling God to keep out of it. I'm, I'm in a better position to run my life than he is. Mm -hmm. That whole, you, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. And that's, the, that's how Christians describe sin. That if sin is about running around telling God the life giver, I'm not that interested in you, 
almost the right outcome of that is what, what if he listens and what if he <laughs> walks? And I think so. I, I think I understood then that death was a right consequence for sin, that if, if sin is about telling God to stay away, death is actually appropriate outcome at some point. Mm. And that when Jesus died, he, he died the death I deserved. That was the way I treated God, not the way he treated God. Mm -hmm. And then when he rose from the dead, it was, it was God saying, um, Jesus takes what you deserve but I'm going to give you what Jesus deserves. So your relationship with God, which is based on you telling him to leave, Jesus takes. His relationship with God, which is about him being a son who's known and loved by his father and knows and loves God in return, that's what I'm giving to you. This two-way swap thing happened. And I thought, man, the resurrection's amazing. Yeah. It's not just about being saved from the consequences of the life I've lived. It's about being saved for a different kind of life, a different kind of relationship with God. Mm. One where I can be confident and secure that I'm known and loved. One where I can be transformed and made different. Mm. Um, and so that just changes everything. It, it means Bible reading becomes listening to your Heavenly Father speak to you. Mm. Not, so you not reading a book about rules. You started reading the Bible at that point? Yeah, that was the first time I started reading the Bible myself. I started praying because I had a father who listened to me. Mm -hmm. It became a relationship, not just a series of things I happened to believe that yeah. didn't actually intersect with my daily life. So what happened when you then read the Bible? What did you discover? Um, I discovered that God is good because I think it's a little bit ambiguous when you just look at the world by itself. Yeah. The world sends mixed messages, I think, about whether God is good. Um, whereas I read the Bible and I see that how do I know that God is good? Well, if Jesus did what he said he did, if he died and rose again for me, that tells me that God is good, whatever is happening in the details of my daily life. So I, I, I understood stuff about God when I read the Bible. I understood stuff about myself. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible, but um, it's a strangely historical document, right? In many ways, it feels quite old. Uh, but in another way, it's a, it's a strangely contemporary document. You read it and you see yourself in the text. Mm. People are kind of just like me. My world is, is just like it's described with all its complexity. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, there, there's, a, there's a grayness in the Bible, which I really appreciate because I think that's real. You mentioned before, Jesus is an uncomfortable character because he asks you questions. Yes. Is that the sort of thing that you encountered when you were reading? The scriptures as yes, well. Yes, I think he. I think he's continually asking me, "Who are you? Why are you like you are? Are you really satisfied with that? Would you be happy if everyone else was like you? Mm. Um, you need to be different, and I can make you different." And I think that's one of the radical things about the Christian message. It's actually about you don't just look around and think that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. You're mm. forced to actually say, "I contribute to that problem." Mm. Mm. So it's not enough for me to identify a solution out there. There's got to be some solution about me being different, me living a different kind of life, a different quality of life, me loving people differently. Mm. Mm. You mentioned that the resurrection, though, was important in your, uh, your understanding or you seeing that the difference that it made in the world uh, or in your life as well. What else did you make of the resurrection? I mean, something happened when you were at 19. Uh, yeah, I think I, I started uni at 19 and I... Um, I think at that point I started asking, why do I believe this? Do I believe this just because I've, I've always been told this and I don't have the courage to ask questions about it? Because changing your mind is quite frightening, actually. If you're, ser if you're seriously asking questions, it's quite scary because you know you might come out with a different answer. Um, and if you've spent 19 years, 40 years, 80 years, I'm not sure that it gets easier as you get older. No, it probably gets harder. That's quite scary. Um, because you've built a life and a series of relationships based on something that now you're wondering, is it right? Um, so at 19, I started asking questions about, can I trust whether these documents are truthful? Can I trust their accounts of history? Because if I can't, there's no point basing my life on this. I'm, mm. I'm actually wasting my life yeah. if I'm basing it on a lie. Mm. Um, so what did you discover? Um, I discovered that I had good reasons to believe the resurrection actually happened. Mm. I had the empty tomb. I had multiple eyewitnesses running around saying, we've seen Jesus rise from the dead. And they're not talking about this vague kind of ghost-like figure where if you stand on one leg and look over there, you kind of vaguely see Jesus. Mm. They're, they're talking about someone they spoke with, talked to, ate with. They're talking about someone appearing in ways they never possibly imagined were possible. Mm. They're talking about someone who's not just saying, yep, we're going to make the Roman government, we're going to get rid of them and make the world a better place. They're talking about a whole new world, a whole new life, a whole new way of living mm. um, that will come one day. So mm. it's not just kind of tweaking the world as we know it. it it's providing a, a different way of living. Mm. Um, I thought about, could I trust the people who wrote the Bible? 
you know, I mean, that's what you do when someone tells you something happened. Part of it is, are they trustworthy people? Are they generally truth-telling? Or do I know them to be liars? Mm. Yeah, the, all of those kind of questions, I think, is, is mm. worth asking. What did they get out of it? Mm. That was a question I asked. Yeah, not much. Not much. Most of them were killed. <laughs> So either they're liars and bad ones or, you know, mm. do, trying to actually work out how you explain the event, if you actually say resurrection is not possible, is an interesting kind of thing to try mm. and do. Mm. Because clearly something happened back then. You need to interpret it some way. Mm. Then your mother died. Mm. How did that affect your understanding of the message of Jesus? Uh, my mother uh, was a Christian. I wasn't confident about that till about three days before she died, interestingly. So as we talk about the resurrection being wish fulfilment, as I look back, I was actually terrified. Yeah. Um, because part of what I believe is you need to trust Jesus uh, to be forgiven. And if mum hadn't trusted Jesus, um, she was saying, I don't need forgiveness. I'm good as I stand. Mm. Um, and that's still true for most of my family and close friends. So it's interesting as we thought about wish fulfillment. Wish fulfillment would lead me to think everyone goes to heaven. Yeah. Right? There's, there's no division. That's what I sometimes think I'd like to be true. Although then heaven would be exactly the same as here because the people who got there would be exactly the same as here. So then <laughs> it's probably not that exciting. Um, I think when mum died, I understood why death was so awful because I realised that death was about the end of relationships, that what I had was a memory and it was a good memory and I'm thankful for the memory. But if there was no life after death, all I have is a memory. And that's a pretty bleak place to be. And I think it's probably still true for some of my family members as they look back at mum's death. But as a Christian, there is a hope of reunion. There is a love that lasts beyond death, which I think we all long for. I think that's one of the horrors of death, actually. It's gone and I see people wrestle with it all the time. I was speaking with friends a few weeks ago and her father-in-law had died and she told her daughter that grandpa's gone to be in heaven. I said, do you believe that? Because it's not as though that's something that is obvious mm. from her daily life. Um, and it's a really hard conversation to have because you always have it in the raw moments, you know, but no one ever wants to talk about it when it's not raw. So I, I find it quite hard. Her comment to me was, it makes me feel better. And I, I just thought, I don't think that works. I, 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 if you know it's, you're saying this to make you feel better, if you know that's your reason for believing this, how does it make you feel better? And what are you telling your daughter about truth if you just make up something you want to be? It was really, uh, yeah, it was an uncomfortable conversation. Mm. Um, so no, I... So you didn't believe the resurrection because it made you feel better? Um, I think it does make me feel better, right, to be honest. Um, the whole idea that there is life after death is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, but equally, I think you can disbelieve the resurrection because it makes you feel better, right? So I, I'm not... If you are worried about having to give an account of your life to God, mm. if you don't like the idea of being accountable to someone else for the way you live, equally, the lack of resurrection could be, you know, wish fulfilment. So I, I don't know that that helps us one way or another mm. uh, in, in resolving the issue. I just think mm. we need to be honest with ourselves about why we believe certain things and go to truth. What about the power of positive thinking, though? I mean, couldn't the resurrection just be a power of positive thinking? Like the book, The Secret, it claimed that expectation is a powerful, attractive force. Ex expect what you want and don't expect what you don't want. I mean, do you think this could work? Um, I think reality comes and bites you when you attempt to do that. Um, when you're dealing with real people in the, in the real world, you, you, can't, you can't imagine things. They react the way they react. The world happens around you. So no, I, I don't, the whole thought of sitting down, I want this to be true, I want this to be true, therefore it will be true. If the resurrection is about living a life with God, God either is or he isn't. He, he doesn't exist based on whether I think he exists. Mm. Right? Now, I, I might choose to believe he's there or not. I, I, can, I can respond to him, but I can't make him real. We're asking Helen Bell today's big question, is the resurrection just wish fulfillment? In chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark, one of the four biographies of Jesus' life that we have, one of Jesus' disciples, Mary Magdalene, leads a group of women to the tomb with spices so that they might anoint Jesus' dead body. So Helen, what do you think these women expected when they went to anoint the body? They expected a dead body. <laughs> yeah. they, they were ready to go. They were stressed about things they hadn't thought about, which, you know, strikes me about grief. You kind of know what you need to know, but you don't necessarily break it down step by step properly. So they're worried about 
my goodness, there's a big stone in front of it. We are women. What do we do? They're, they're worried about, um, you know, it's been a number of days after the death. What's it yeah. going to be like when they get there? It's, it's not a pretty, death is not a, a pretty thing. Mm. Um, they're going there. They're doing exactly what you would expect Jewish women to do when someone they loved died. That is mm. exactly what you would expect. We show him respect. Mm. But they encounter something strange when they arrived. The, the stone had been rolled away. So they, they enter the tomb and they see a man dressed in white sitting on the right side. Now, the women were alarmed. Um, is their response reasonable, do you think? I wouldn't know what to do with the fact of a glowing white man and no body. <laughs> Um, angels are fascinating. Whenever people see angels, kind of don't be alarmed, don't be alarmed. They're not nice little cherubs that keep people calm. They're big scary beasts that scare people. Yeah. Um, they were freaked because, and it, I don't know, when things happen in life that you have no box to put them in, that is kind of freaky. You, you do get a bit scared and you do wonder what to do. Mm. Um, so I, I think it makes perfect sense that they were they were alarmed. They were alarmed. I mean, it helps also respond perhaps alarmed. to the big question that the resurrection is not just wish fulfilment. They weren't expecting this at all. They weren't expecting it at all. It's it's kind of a Mark. You're reading from Mark's gospel. It's kind of a strange ending in some ways. All the other biographies of Jesus talk about you know they see him in lots of different places, right? This particular one ends with and the women left and they were terrified. Yes, yeah, not you a great kind ending. Of think, I could do better than that. <laughs> and in fact, there are additional ending, endings. People do think, yeah, I could do better than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, it may, I think what it's, it's inviting you to do is to ask questions. Did this happen? How do I work out whether this happened? And if you've read the whole story, um, fear and faith have been juxtaposed throughout the book. Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. So if it was a panto, right, you'd get to the end of it, the women, don't be afraid, just believe, is what you'd be shouting out. Mm. Not because of wish fulfilment. So throughout, Mark, it's not about, I want this to be true, just trust it. It's a continual demonstration of who Jesus is. He is one you can trust. He is one who is powerful. Believe what he says because he acts on what he says. And he's already told them at this point that he's coming back from the dead. Mm. He's actually told them that, but they haven't been able to, to, process it. to process it at all. And so they're still in, this is what happens when people die. Oh, my goodness, Jesus is not like any other person. Mm. So for me, one of the things the resurrection does is tells me Jesus is not like any other person. This is not normal that a man comes back from the dead. Mm. And if it happened every day and we weren't surprised, Jesus would be nothing special. It's the fact. If it happened, it actually really matters that it happened once. Mm. So I think you're meant to be sitting there saying, think about who Jesus is. Mm. Think about what he said. Think about what he's done. Start to work out what this resurrection means. And I think Mark, that, that biography, gives you the space to be freaked out by, to be trying to wrestle with how does it fit, what do I understand this, and to actually then move forward from that. Mm. It's not kind of, oh, yeah, they saw him from the dead. Excellent. <laughs> Let's skip off into the sunset understanding this completely. There's mm. a real wrestle mm. with it. Well, the man actually says to the women, he says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So what do we make of this? Oh, it's a little bit of a rebuke, isn't it? <laughs> what are you doing here, woman? Um, <laughs> that's, no, that's not kind. Um, I think he's saying there's a future. There are things to be done now. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a Jesus to be met, the resurrected Jesus to be met. That's what he said would happen. Um, there's work to be done, so it's almost like it introduces what, what, what's going to happen between now and I, I think when Jesus returns. Because mm -hmm. uh, if he's alive, he can come back. If he's a dead man, that makes no sense, actually. Yeah. You've got good reasons, or you've shared some reasons why you believe the resurrection to be true, Helen, but what difference does it make in your life? Um, it gives me great comfort uh, when I think about my mother. So there is a, a real sense that it actually helps me think about death differently. It gives me joy, I think, that suffering and death don't have the final say. That if Jesus came back from the dead, suffering is not the final word on this world. There is a hope of something better. It tells me that injustice doesn't have the final say that people declared Jesus worthless, that's why they killed him, and God overturned the verdict by raising him from the dead. So it tells me that certain things that are horrible in this world, while they're true now, don't win in the end. And it, I know that I am loved 
it tells me that Jesus is alive and I have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. I don't just have a belief system about him. I know him. There's, there's, how to put this, there's a real relationship. Mm. Now, that's, that's experiential, right? I'm not expecting that to persuade anyone else that Jesus is risen from the dead. Mm. Right? I, I, I get that. But nonetheless, it's real. You, you know when someone... How do I know my mother loves me? I just knew she did. And I could point to a whole heap of things that she'd said or done that confirmed that. But how do I know I experienced her love in all sorts of details of life? Mm. I feel like that the resurrection gives me that. I know that Jesus is alive because he loves me. Now, I don't want to... Yeah, experience matters too. Yeah. Because if it's real, if it actually happened, it has to make a difference to the way you live. Mm. There has to be a relationship that flows out of it. So could you believe it without the relationship? I don't know. If you did believe it, I think the relationship would probably have to follow. Mm, mm. So it confirms it, if that makes sense. So. Mm. What about a sense of... Maybe a sense of peace or something that would, would that come from having a relationship with the risen Jesus? It tells me that whatever happens in this life is temporary. There's a rest, I would say, that comes with the resurrection because it means I'm not running around trying to prove myself, make my mark on this world, worried about the future. I mean, yes, I do those things, but <laughs> I've actually got a way of short, you know, when I see myself doing that, actually saying, Let, let's, let's look at the real world, Helen. Yeah. The real world is that God is in control. The real world is a world where God loves you. I know that because Jesus is risen from the dead. Um, so I think it gives a real rest and a peace. So Helen, is the resurrection just wish fulfillment? I don't believe so. I don't think it, I don't think it makes sense to say it was for the first witnesses. Doesn't read that way. Um, I don't think that's how I fundamentally think about it. Um, and I, is it good news? Yes. Am I glad it's true? Yes. But that doesn't in and of itself make it wish fulfillment. Yeah. It could just be good news that resonates. Mm. Let me leave you with the Bible's answer to the big question. Is the resurrection just wish fulfillment? From Mark 16, 6. Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. I look forward to you joining us next time for bigger questions. Please thank our guest today, Helen Bell. <laughs>